Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, stopping your conversations out there and joining us. You have a, uh, an opportunity to keep, get it back going again after the session as we all head over to the Microsoft building for a meet and play. But you're here now, and this is going to be a super fun, uh, I, I called it a social experiment because uh, we've never done this before. But we thought it'd be really fun if we brought together some of the luminaries that have been part of the Games for Change community over the last 20 years and share some ideas and predictions they had back in the day that they got totally wrong. <laughs> so that was the challenge. And do it within three minutes. So we have a three minute, I will say, Pecha Kucha style. Did I pronounce it right? All right, style, right? We, we are, they can control their own slides. Some people may not use slides, but the idea is high energy. We'll see about the visuals. Get it done in three minutes. And to keep them all in line, we've got Nick Fortugno, who is going to act as our MC. I know, he's awesome. Nick has been on stage earlier today. He will be on stage again. Um, he's the co-founder of Playmatics and also the director of um, the... Ga Thank you, I was gonna get there. The Gaming Pathways program at CCNY. Um, so please, why don't we uh, give a big round of applause for Nick and he's gonna manage this whole <laughs> fun event. Let's say, Nick, come on up. Hi everybody, how you doing? Oh yeah, yeah, come on. Lightning round, lightning round. Yeah, so lightning round. It's gonna be like lightning. You're gonna blink, you're gonna miss it. You got it? Three minutes, each of our speakers, luminaries from the field, experienced designers, producers, business people, people who founded the festival, people who've been to the festival forever, are coming up here to tell you what they thought Games for Change was going to be 20 years ago. What would Games for Impacts be 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago? And how did they get that right and how did they get that wrong? They will do this in three minutes. I will be timing them to three minutes. We will hold that hard. It is not a strict speca. The slides won't move as fast as you expect. They have freedom in that and that is the only freedom they have. And with that, we are going to start. There's a three minute timer here, by the way. Um, if you are a speaker and you're listening to this, I will approach you as we get to the last 30 seconds. So if you are still going, I will stop you. And you will know that because I will slowly stalk you like Jaws. <laughs> we ready? <laughs> Barry Joseph has never missed a Games for Change festival and has lived to tell the tale. And since he was the first in the door, we thought it fitting that he start us off. afternoon, I come before you to preach the gospel of games for change. Can I get it all right? Thank you. In the beginning, our gospel was limited and often used against us. We wanted to highlight small games addressing social issues that made the world a better place through other people playing them. The media looked at us and said, Come again? Let us put attention on these few good games so we can continue to make people afraid of the vast ocean of bad games. We never meant to walk into a binary, but we soon learned how false this idea was. We learned from James Paul G that all games have the potential to embody good learning. We learned from Bernie DeCoven, may his memory be a blessing, that all play has the potential to form a community actively building a world that reflects their values. And at the 10th Games for Change, I noticed a trend. The change in Games for Change was changing. It no longer came just from someone playing a game. It was also about who was creating it and how. We began to speak more regularly about high school students designing games. We began to talk about, for example, indigenous communities making their own game design studios to tell their ancestral stories. So what today is the gospel of games for change? And who is it for? 20 years ago, I was one of the people who co-founded Games for Change. Last year, 
I co-founded Gaming Pathways, working with an amazing group of partners to launch a new way for black and Latinx high school students in New York City to connect with the vast New York City gaming industry, passing through New York City's amazing public college system. Our upcoming video game exhibit, which will open next year at the Harlem School of the Arts, had a youth advisory. And we asked them just a few months ago what games they play associated with the theme of social justice. And what they said blew me away. The action role-playing game, Dark Souls 2. The big budget, Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and the games are changed, darling, papers, please. 20 years ago, we could hardly fill a panel with games. Today, you can find games for change just about anywhere. Some Shabbats, I go to Temple. Sorry, the clock is ticking. When I do, I'm with the community that is not looking at who is good in the room and who is bad. Instead, it's a collective process that calls us all to our better angels. It's a reset, a time to check in with our values and expect more from ourselves. That, I suggest, is the current gospel of Games for Change, that we all need a time and place like this right now, right here, to come together and look at our intentions when we make games. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take a hug. There you go. Alan Gershenfeld is the president of E-Line Media, formerly board chair of Games for Change and studio head of Activision who I might have to let in. <laughs> Hello again. My three minutes starting? Yes. OK. Uh, I'm going to talk about one prediction and one goal. Um, you know, when I, when I, I'm a big fan of public media. And when I first started at Games for Change, I came across this white paper by Dave Rajeski. He was referenced earlier in one of the panels. And he wrote a very interesting thought piece in 2006 saying, we have a corporation for public broadcasting. As we've seen in this conference, games are incredibly powerful. Why not a corporation for public gaming? And that just stuck in my head. I thought, that's something Games for Change can help urge into existence. And you know, I think a lot of people in this room probably are fans of PPS and NPR. and. You know, folks that are involved in, there's 350 local stations, they serve a critical role in their communities. Public media serves something very, very valuable, but it's mostly film and TV. If, if anybody uh, uh, hasn't seen this, Fred Rogers, uh, um, when he testified for why we need public media before the Senate in the late 1960s, a very grumpy senator was grilling him. Google this when this talk's over. Uh, I promise you it's worth watching this, it's on YouTube. By the end of it, his whole body position had changed, and he had basically unlocked the funding. It's one of the most powerful clips on just the power of public media. And when I watched that, even more so, I thought this idea of the Corporation for Public Gaming just sounded like a good idea. Um, public media is great with young kids. It's absolutely great. Um, and you know, lots of shows a lot of people in this room grew up with. It's great for little kids but it kind of falls off a cliff at the age of seven or eight. And it picks up again at Downton Abbey and uh, <laughs> Antiques Roadshow. Um, and there's a, there's a big gap in, in, in that. So I, I ask, you know, why, why can't public media be relevant for tweens, teens, and young adults? This is a critical generation um, that we need to reach. And, and sometimes commercial media, media is just not effective at, at, at media and games in the public interest. And so I, I was, so I would say from a prediction standpoint, we weren't totally off. PBS Kids is phenomenal, and they have great games, and a lot of families rely on it. So in one sense, the traditional uh, infrastructure did embrace games, and they're very successful for young kids. And I think one of the speakers is going to talk about the Federal Gaming Guild. There are actually program officers across 20 or 30 different government agencies that are doing games in the public interest, and they're sharing best practices. So that's kind of interesting, but it's not the same thing as the rigor of a true corporation for public gaming. So, I think that there's still a lot of unrealized potential. We didn't realize that. I was hoping we would realize it. So on the hit and miss meter, I think we're about maybe 22% towards that goal. 
And I think it's a really interesting question is, who would the Mr. Rogers be that could testify, in, we have a couple people raising their hands, that, 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 that could testify in the Senate and get the kind of reaction that he had to create public interest games that the commercial media won't do that reach demographics and psychographics uh, that they're not currently reaching. I'm done. <laughs> We lost a couple seconds to the realization of the slides moving, so I was. Yeah, uh, <laughs> on the other side. Okay, lesson learned. Lesson learned. Uh, Lindsey Grace is curator for Games for Change 2023 Festival. I mean, this one. Um, 2019 Games for Change Vanguard awardee, University of Miami Knight Chair in Interactive Media, and the Vice President of the Higher Education Video Game Alliance. All right, this kind of talk is my speed. This is exactly how I operate, so this is great. Uh, as soon as I'm able to hit the play button, forward button. What's going on? All right, so I'm gonna give you three things in, uh, three things we did right and three things we did wrong in three minutes. Uh, so what we, I got right wrong um, to start. Uh, there's this, this expectation that there be more and bigger budget social impact games, uh, which we've seen with things like Minecraft EDU, uh, and we've seen in games like Life is Strange, um, you can cheer on anything you like, uh, and Concrete Genie in 2017, and by 2023 we have things like Dot Home and It Takes Two, and we've got some really uh, interesting focal points for, for specific games. Number two was integrating social impact into commercial games. This is one of our early predictions. Uh, and so we do see this evidence in things like Discovery Tour uh, for Assassin's Creed, uh, Explore the World uh, that's been created. And then citizen sciences initiatives like uh, Borderlands Science and other games with a purpose. Uh, we also have um, opportunities to sort of understand systems and worlds through games by 2020, converting commercial properties into things that are also quote unquote social impact games. And number three was actually about global growth of social impact games, which I really am quite proud of the progress that we've made. So back in 2014, I remember sitting on a panel with uh, Colleen Mackley and some folks from um, uh, from Games for Change, and we were really just talking about the power diversity and how the world in games is gonna change. And by like 2015, there's this Voice of America video where I'm explicitly talking about that, uh, and I'm quoted as saying, diversity and social impact games is coming. Uh, and then by like 2022, uh, last year, I was working in, for the US Embassy trying to promote social impact games, and we had 70 people making social impact games in KL. And then we've got activities like um, Games for Change Abu Dhabi, uh, woo, right? Um, and uh, in 2023, working with the State Department, we got 10 ASEAN nations to get together, offer 75 devs to make games across nations on social impact. I think it's a really good indicator for the future of social impact. So let's talk about what I got wrong. <laughs> um, one of the things I definitely got wrong was docu-games. I have plenty of stuff where I was like, oh, docu-games are the future. Every game's gonna be a documentary game, and I was dead wrong. Um, current trends in the growth of games, lowering production costs, blah, blah, blah. As such, docu-games for preservation demonstrate the promise of offering 21st century educational experiences for future learners. I was wrong. Um, and I even made some of this junk, um, so I admit it. Uh, this is one of the games I made back in 2009. It was not good. Um, I will just tell you that now. Uh, and I, I was really excited about photorealism and archived content. I still love play, so I'm just gonna say docu-games is a big oops. Number two, more academic social impact game studios. So there are some great ex uh, examples, uh, and I funded and ran a few uh, in my history, but basically academic infrastructure prevents you from succeeding. And number three, it was Sisyphus. <laughs> Assuming people here and read academics, you don't. Why would you read this? This is so hard to understand. Look at these words. So, <laughs> don't do it. And I used to do this, now I do this. I package it in one book, give you that instead. <laughs> and we're gonna keep trying. Thank you. <laughs> Colleen Macklin is an associate professor at Parsons School of Design and a game designer whose most recent game, Dear Reader, can be found on the Apple Arcade. Oh man, I can't do this in three minutes. Um, this is impossible. So what are the best and worst predictions that you made? Blah, blah, blah. We all know the premise. Uh, where's the clicker? <laughs> there we go. Uh, next slide. Okay, 
What did this turn into? This is a millions of years old uh, creature. No one knows. OK, well, it turned into this. And then this, come on now. How can you make a prediction? Uh, it's impossible, <laughs> OK? No, I didn't make any predictions. Um, but we can go back in time to my first Games for Change. This is 2006. It was at the new school where I teach. And mm, there's some white guys there. Uh, Bob Carey, former senator, was the current president of the university. And actually, he's kind of why I got my start in Games for Change. He was like, make a game about the Electoral College for kids. And I was like, yeah, sure. We made this game. We showed it to Bob and all the senior vice presidents of the university. The men at the table, there were only men at the table except for me, uh, basically said, this is too fun. It doesn't have gravitas. And that's when I learned something's working. <laughs> you make the Electoral College fun? Come on now. Well, this was made in Flash. Uh, one prediction I made is that Flash is the future. Well, Flash is a Flash. <laughs> um, but at the 2006 conference, I moderated a panel with the creators of Second Life. And I thought to myself, this thing is a flash in the pan. There's no way. I just looked at their stats. They have 200,000 daily active users as of today. And 600 million GDP. I did not know they were a country, but apparently they have a GDP. Um, so, okay, I stand corrected again. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? Okay, so I'm going to make some really wild predictions for GDC 2043, 20 years from now, which will look like this, right? No. Uh, <laughs> games will destroy the world. You probably haven't heard that at many Games for Change conferences. Uh, but here's, here's why. Games are the training ground, right? They're the fruit fly. I don't really understand how that works, but Constance and Kurt said that earlier, and I want to ask them about that. They're the fruit fly of AI. They're the training ground. They're how AI is trained and sort of tested. Um, and the problems with generative AI, in addition to burning the planet because they're super CO2 emitting, um, is a bunch of other stuff, right? Bias, stealing creators' work, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to hedge my bets. Games will save the world. <laughs> OK? In the same way right, that, that games have been the training ground for these systems, I think actually they're going to show us new ways of thinking. They're going to give us like alien forms of thought. Beatrice Fozzi, the philosopher, Nick's coming to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, has, has called it that. And I think that Move 27, if you've seen the AlphaGo documentary, check it out, um, was a move that uh, Go players would have never predicted, and it is ultimately creative and forces us to think in new ways. So, yeah, hedge my bets. Destroy, save, thanks. <laughs> Show of hands thought Second Life still existed. <laughs> Just curious. Kurt Squire is an, a professor in informatics at UC Irvine, where he teaches in the game program. And recently, he recently wrote a book, Making Games for Impact. All right, this is exciting. So I've got, um, I've got three, not just one, but three bad predictions. I skipped the good ones because those are boring. I don't even know if I had any good ones. Um, number one, uh, my favorite one was after playing the World of Warcraft demo in 2004. I don't get this. This doesn't make any sense. This is the same game I've played for the last 10 years. This is going to be a flop. That was number one. Number two, Minecraft is cool. Upon playing the demo, this is really great. It's too bad that the graphics are so janky. No one's ever going to play this. <laughs> And there's no onboarding, and oh man, they really screwed up. And of course, we know they were wrong. Kids made it their own, fell in love with it, and now it is probably the most successful game of all time. Um, but the last one I really want to focus on is that in 18 to 36 months, Games for Impact are really going to take off. <laughs> and I have said this not just one time, but this is me in 2002, that oh, the so software platforms, hardware, educational markets will mature so it can really take off and in schools. Um, we saw some good things happen, right? So distribution got easier. We got broadband. We've got Steam. 
Um, development, Flash, much like Colleen. I was very excited about Flash. Uh, <laughs> am to this day. Um, X and A. But, okay, once these things come together, we're really going to see it. So, but what we saw was that the pieces were there, but there wasn't a real, true, genuine market. Inter a lot of interesting proof of concepts. Fast forward a couple more years. 18 to 36 months from now, software platforms, hardware platforms, educational markets will converge to make these really common in schools. And what do we happen? Well, now we've got distribution kind of taken care of, right? We've got Steam, we've got Apple distribution, um, Flash and Unity are now rolling, so people can make games much more easily. They're much more democratized. You can get them out there. Um, but the problem really was getting these into schools. So we know things like iCivics actually did prove that it could be done. In the immediate years following, I should say, this is like 2007, 2008, uh, iCivics, Plague Inc., and eventually Minecraft took off. Yet, we know that mostly, with a few minor exceptions, most of what happened in things like schools remained unchanged. A couple of years later, no, 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 no. Now we're going to get it. 18 to 36 months later, blah, 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 blah. And again, we saw the distributions there, developments right there. But next, we had the problem of the hardware platforms, right? Are we getting Chromebooks? LAUSD is buying iPads, if you remember that. That's going to change everything. And then, uh, rewind, there was a little bit of a scandal there. Um, Chromebooks aren't that really good for gaming. So we did, though, still have indie games, Don't Starve, Journey, Gone Home, proving that these things were really possible. So now, uh, a couple years later, there we are, 13 to 16 months software, blah, blah, take off in schools. Um, and now I'm going to say I personally have no idea what's happening. <laughs> We've got a number of exciting projects, like in the, in the subsequent years after that, Kerbal, Undertale, things like Shovel. Indie games are everywhere. I mean, documentary games, even though um, Lindsay maybe didn't think they succeeded. Revolution 1979, a great game. I think it's proved that these things can happen. We thought that kids weren't going to be buying, we weren't Parents are going to be buying books for their teachers, but for the school students, sorry, but that they are. I'm going to point to at least two things we need to think about. Number one is teachers and machines, the argument that schools have embraced technologies that make learning more reliable and easy. And then last, what we know about schools is sorting machines in America. So thank you. <laughs> so the baller move is to hand the the slide clicker to the moderator as you walk off stage. Uh, Noah Falstein is a game designer with a dozen current Game for Health clients. OK, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to go back a lot farther. I've got a lot of predictions here, and uh, they're following the over-optimistic theme you've been hearing. Uh, when, so this is about 50 years ago when I was 15. I saw this in the arcade where there were all the pinball games, this wonderful futuristic thing with a screen, and it was run by a computer. And I said, yeah, there's going to be a lot more of these. So I made one good prediction there, but uh, it, it went downhill a little bit after that. Um, not that long after, just graduating college, uh, Milton Bradley made a lot of money with this Simon thing. They're still selling them now, all these years later. And they said, yeah, you want to come and make video games for us? And I thought, wow, this is great. And I, I told my mom about it. This was a, a, a picture, you know, a little bit before that time. She said, yeah, uh, you don't want to be a doctor? I I'm, come from a Jewish family. It's, no, I, I really think really think that these games are going to be big. And she said, are you sure they're not a fad? And I said, I could always go back to just doing the computer programming stuff. And she said, well, yeah, computer's probably not a fad. So she predicted that one right. And I just went on from there. Uh, Ten years into my career, I was working at LucasArts. And we're finally starting to make some money with our games. And I, I talked to a guy named Howard there, the head of licensing. You know, we're really starting to move the chart on, you know, compared to some of the movie stuff Lucasfilm is doing, we're, we're getting on the, the, the chart there. And he said, you know, I, I hate to break it to you, but last year all the games combined that LucasArts did didn't make as much money as Star Wars licensing for pajamas alone. <laughs> so that was a little bit depressing. But I kept going. I went freelance. I found out that games for health are a thing. So I did this work with a, a company called Hope Lab on remission. I thought, yeah, these games for health in 10 years, they're going to be everywhere. Yeah, well, it, it's taken a little longer. But, but a little more than 10 years later, I got involved with a NeuroRacer project that l later became Achille Interactive. And today is, is uh, uh, FDA cleared, and you know, they went public. But you know, it didn't really take off quite as quickly as I thought. Another prediction. And then I was at Google, and yeah, this Google Glass, that's going to be everywhere. Yeah, well, OK. Um, but 
we've seen this a lot. I don't think people have actually heard. We've yeah. been hearing that games now are bigger than movies and music combined. <laughs> They're almost three times bigger than music and movie combined. So it's taken a while, and that's the thing. A lot of my predictions, not right right away, certainly not in 10 years, but give it a little bit of time, and it's bigger than the Star Wars pajamas, so take that, Howard. Nice. I've got a bunch of different clients at this point. It's really exciting to see how much is going on. Uh, it, I really think the digital therapeutics are not a fad. This is going to be a big thing. It's getting bigger all the time. And mom, I'm still not a doctor, but at least I work with them now. So give it another 10 years. Thank you. Uh, so I don't, I, I, you know, being, being a game designer myself, I don't, I don't believe in putting people through humiliations that I don't put myself through, so I will do it fast and just say that many, many, for many, many years, about 10 years ago, I said that games were like a tsunami and that if you looked at it like a tsunami, that education was underwater and journalism was looking at the wave and healthcare was watching the water recede and wonder what happened, meaning that any day... Uh, healthcare would get over inundated by a wave of gamification that would transform healthcare. This was in 2008. <laughs> so I'm, I'm waiting too. <laughs> uh, can we have a round of applause for our, our very new here? You guys take your bows. This is when we judge and we say which was the worst prediction. No, I won't do that. I won't do that. But everyone, round of applause. Don't we get extra points for actually being on time? Yeah. Just Seriously, yeah, and a little, little selfie there. Come on, do a picture. All right. I, I don't know why I brought you up here except to say a big bow. Thank you very much.